So, hello, beautiful people. Uh, my name is Brian Mahoney. I am the editorial director of Chronogram Media, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's discussion on Legal Weed is Coming, a chronogram conversation examining the prospect of and ramifications of recreational marijuana being legalized in New York, possibly this year. Um, first, I want to apologize for the timing of this afternoon's event. It occurred to me uh, today that we're a little off brand here. We began at 4 p.m. It's clear that we probably should have started at 4.20, um, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's just what happens. Um, we've got a wonderful panel and we're gonna get to them in a minute, but just a couple of housekeeping notes to start. Please keep yourself on mute for the duration of the event. Uh, mute means that the microphone or your computer is turned off. We can't hear your dog barking, the person on the couch next to you doing bong hits, all of those things. So please type your questions into the chat window and we will triage them for our panelists. Um, after my introductory remarks, we'll hear a word from our wonderful sponsor, Etain, and then uh, the panelists will talk for two minutes about what they do and then we will get into our panel question and answer. And if you guys have burning questions, we will ask the panel and then we will hopefully uh, close around five. Um, regarding your questions to the panel, again, use the chat window. Um, oh, and then the last thing I wanna say is that this is a Zoom call that is being recorded and will be published on chronogram.com next week. So. If you're in the federal witness protection program, have unpaid gambling debts, or have stacks of marijuana in one pound packages that you are storing for a friend visible behind you, now is a good time to turn off your video and change your on-screen alias. Um, Department of Shameless Self-Promotion. The March issue of Chronogram hit stands March 1st, and it also contains the second part of our series on possible weed legalization in New York State. Uh, and you can look for that and the spring issue of Upstate House on stands March 1st, or even better, you could subscribe. And very soon, a magical link is going to appear in the chat window on how you can link to and subscribe to Chronogram and Upstate House. Uh, our next Chronogram conversation will take place on March 25th about a topic all the kids are crazy about, passive house construction. Um, no, I joke, um, but passive house construction is the construction standard that may save us from climate change. So look for that March 25th. And we're, we also have a huge section in Upstate House in the spring issue on passive house construction. Uh, we also just ended nominations round for 2021 chronograms. Um, Sam, if you're out there, can we give any sneak peeks of our nomination round winners? We will have the ballot updated within the next couple of days. So you can go to chronogrammies.com in the next couple of days to see the top five in each category. Awesome. Uh, and once that's live, uh, voting will begin on April 1st and continue through May 15th, and we will crown another year's worth of chronogrammies winners and we have a number of uh, cbd and weed categories this year so that's going to be uh, exciting and relevant to this conversation and now without further ado i would like to give the mic over to uh, hillary from etain our sponsor hillary great thank you it's great to meet you and i'm really excited for the conversation and for the opportunity to have sponsored this, I think it's really important that we have these discussions as uh, legalization is being proposed and potentially ratified by uh, April 1st in New York. Um, I am the Chief Operating Officer of ETAIN LLC, which um, was one of the original five licenses in New York given. Um, we are the only women owned and the only family owned company in New York State. We are vertically integrated. So we cultivate, we manufacture, and we dispense to four different dispensaries. Uh, we have one in the Hudson Valley uh, on Route 28 in Kingston and our flagship store in Manhattan, as well as one in Yonkers and in Syracuse. Um, and we are currently 
in New York, just a medical company. Um, but you can go to our website, www.etainhealth.com or a handle at Etain Health uh, to learn how to get enrolled in the program and more about who qualifies for it and everything there. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Hillary, um, how easy is it right now to get um, a medical marijuana card in New York? So it's actually not as complicated as I think people think it is, uh, especially now with the world of telemedicine really taking off. There's a lot of options for people to reach out to physicians who are qualified to register New Yorkers for the program. Um, but basically, uh, with a quick Google search, you can find a provider uh, who can uh, determine whether or not you meet New York's qualifications. And there's a specific set of symptoms, um, which include things like uh, IBS or um, chronic pain, um, which are sort of widespread uh, chronic illnesses that many people suffer from. Um, and they will determine if you qualify and you can get a card um, and get registered in the program. Oh, so that sounds a lot less onerous than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, it's definitely, uh, right now, there's a lot of improvements that have been made. And I think more people, especially with telemedicine, have been able to sort of adapt ways to more quickly and, and uh, sort of frictionless uh, ways of getting enrolled in the program. Okay, one more question before I move on to the other panelists for now. Um, is Etain ready to make a transition into uh, adult recreational if uh, it's legalized? So we actually just relaunched our whole brand with a refresh and focus on uh, health and wellness and uh, more lifestyle products and um, packaging, et cetera, and the ways our products are used for our patients. Because we do see in a, a recreational market that there are still significant populations who are using products in a medical setting for a health and wellness purpose. So whether it's a sore ankle or uh, a good night's sleep, those are still technically like medical applications of products that I think um, ours transition nicely to meet the needs of New Yorkers. So we're definitely looking at it and it will be interesting to see how everything shakes out. And uh, we're watching as uh, New York uh, moves through its proposal process. Nice, thank you, Hillary. Um, Meg Sanders, CEO of Canna Provisions. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, uh, first of all, hello everyone. And thank you uh, to the chronogram and all the panelists for participating today. I've had the extreme pleasure as well as a lot of challenges in uh, participating in, the, in a regulated cannabis market since 2009. And um, this is my second enterprise as far as operations. Um, I was the CEO of a company called Mindful in Colorado um, up until 2017, and then I went into some consulting work for a while. Um, actually, we worked very hard at Mindful on the New York medical bill. Um, we were, uh, at that time, a company called Gaia and worked directly with a lot of the stakeholders um, on trying to pass a, a thoughtful bill. Um, and at the end there, it kind of changed quite a bit and was not exactly something we were thrilled with. But um, needless to say, um, through the consulting work that we've done, I ended up in Massachusetts back in operations and I'm the CEO of Canna Provisions located in Lee, Massachusetts. We're the first exit from the New York border. Um, we're about 40 minutes from Albany and um, we're in the home of the Berkshires, which is a massive tourist destination and has become even more so that uh, during COVID. So it's a very exciting place for cannabis right now. And even though there's a lot of challenges and businesses around um, the nation, uh, cannabis adult use dispensaries, um, except for being shut down by the governor for two months, we have definitely seen our, our customer base grow and um, the, the, the choice of wellness and using this product to help with the stresses of this particular pandemic has been um, enormous, en enormously um, welcomed by our consumers. So we're thrilled to be here. Um, and I would just say, you know, I, I was very lucky to participate as one of the only, I was the only cannabis business um, person on the governor's task force in the state of Colorado when we were going from medical to adult use. So I worked hard working on, on thoughtful regulations to get us from medical to an adult use market. And here in Massachusetts, you know, we have, we started, we were the 21st dispensary to open. Um, and it has been I mean, a thrill a minute and also super challenging, but at the same time, you know, we're really grateful to be here. 
And I would say overall, we're really looking forward to helping with our neighbors. Um, we obviously enjoy a ton of customers from New York, um, but we uh, have a lot of experience and a lot of thoughts on what could happen in New York. And we're hoping to see incredibly thoughtful legislation go through that will support a healthy, robust market um, that especially focuses on equity. And um, that is definitely our platform. Super, thank you. Um, Marcus Williams, Vice President of Community Growth Partners. Rebel, how are you? Good, thanks, Brian. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, definitely really excited to be a part of this panel and participate in this conversation today. Um, yeah, I, uh, I guess let me just get into a little background about myself. Uh, uh, I am Marcus Williams. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Community Growth Partners. Uh, we are a woman and minority owned cannabis company, a uh, vertically integrated cannabis company in Massachusetts. Um, and we were founded in 2018 by my partner, Charlotte Hanna, uh, who is our president and CEO. Charlotte is uh, actually from Brooklyn. So, you know, we, we, we've got quite a bit of a New York connection. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, long story short, you know, Charlotte and I crossed paths in 2019 uh, and really started to put into motion uh, our vision for uh, a different type of cannabis company in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, as far as the vibe we go for, but I think more importantly, uh, some things we want to exact on the social impact side of the spectrum. Uh, you know, Charlotte's a big believer in just capital, uh, which was something that I, I've been learning intimately about, you know, which is uh, capitalist ventures that can be very profitable, but use those profits, you know, for the good of the communities in which they operate. Uh, you know, it's something that I think we need to see more businesses in all industries do. Uh, it's something that I thought was very exciting to participate in. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we rolled our sleeves up in 2019 and started pursuing licensing in Massachusetts. Uh, I'd like to say, I, I think we were fairly successful. Uh, we captured three provisional licenses in 2019 uh, for retail cultivation and product manufacturing. Um, unfortunately, you know, COVID hit the world and, and things got impacted, but uh, I'm proud to say that we did successfully get our retail license to commence operations status. Uh, and we are currently operational uh, also in the Berkshires uh, in the town of Great Barrington. We have our retail storefront called Rebel. Uh, uh, Rebel is also more so than just a brick and mortar storefront, uh, the, the name of our cannabis brand. You know, we kind of see cannabis uh, moving more into kind of a lifestyle mode as opposed to just being a, a commodity. You know, and that was another, uh, I think, very forward thinking part of Charlotte's vision uh, from a business perspective that I got excited about. And uh, I think from that aspect, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing some wins and doing some things, you know, slightly differently than, than has been seen so far in the market here in Massachusetts. Um, so that's kind of where we are as a business. You know, uh, I'm working very hard to get our cultivation up and running uh, and our product manufacturing up and running this year. Uh, we anticipate having actual Rebel branded products on the market later this year. Um, and, you know, we do have a lot of things we want to do as far as community engagement uh, and social impact. You know, one thing I'm very proud of is uh, the, the CCC here highlighted our diversity and social impact plans as some of the best that they've seen in the state. Uh, and we were able to tell them that, you know, we were successful in many of those goals when we renewed our licensing this year. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're kind of a trailblazer in that sense. Uh, you know, I would just say outside of cannabis, just some of my background before this venture, you know, I do have a technology background. Uh, prior to uh, partnering with Charlotte, uh, I worked for a, a sizable microchip firm for a while. Um, I was able to witness that firm transfer from a hardware company making microchips to a software company uh, taking over the burgeoning IoT space. Uh, you know, a lot of just uh, hectic times there. And I can definitely say there was a big part of that learning experience that I, that I brought over to this market, which as you know, is very disparate. It, it varies from state to state, regulation to regu regulation, operation to operation. Uh, and you know, I, I just think, you know, some of the things uh, I, I, I had to do in my old life, like uh, managing a 500 node virtual network uh, or just managing a team of stressful engineers in different time zones. I mean, just so much of that stress uh, translated to cannabis uh, fairly well. So I think I developed some thick skin that, that was very helpful there. Um, and yeah, you know, lastly, I'll just say as far as my relationship with cannabis, you know, I, uh, I'm i 36 years old. I, I've had a relationship with, with Mary Jane since I've been 18. Uh, very much a cannabis enthusiast myself. 
Uh, very much interested in the genetic side of cannabis. I've been collecting seed stocks since 2003. Uh, I've been cultivating myself since 2011. Uh, and I've been working on my own genetics since 2016. So from that aspect, you know, there's there's definitely some interesting things I'm hoping to uh, bring to market here in Massachusetts and uh, glad to have the opportunity to do that as well. Awesome. Thanks, Marcus. Um, that's a whole kind of side genre of this, our personal relationship with uh, with cannabis. Um, yeah, I, I, have a, I have a tight 80 or 90 minutes on that. Um, uh, anyway, uh, Melissa Moore uh, is the New York State uh, Policy Director for Drug Policy Alliance. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thanks so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Um, so just a quick note, Drug Policy Alliance um, is the leading organization working to end criminalization for drugs and drug use um, and establish a more just society in which the regulation of drugs is actually grounded in science and compassion and health and human rights and where people aren't punished anymore for what they put in their own bodies um, and really shifting a lot of the stigma and the fear that's driven so much of policymaking in the past toward more, more sound and more um, policies and provisions um, all across the country. So I have you know, colleagues who are working on the federal level around legalization, as well as um, you know, colleagues in other states that are working on other substances, and as I do too in New York. Um, but given that cannabis is the focus of this conversation, um, I'll also say that I'm a member of the Start Smart Coalition, which stands for Sensible Marijuana Access Through Regulated Trade. It's the leading um, campaign and coalition working on not just legalization by any means, but working toward marijuana justice in New York. So, you know, we've been, you know, for years now working with um, people who are dedicated to having a, a just and fair legalization process for New York State. Um, and that's everybody from, you know, criminal justice reformers, civil rights advocates, public health entities, community-based organizations, faith-based institutions. The tent is really, really large when we talk about justice, equity, and community reinvestment within cannabis in New York. Um, and so, you know, DPA in particular has been involved in this space since our work to repeal the Rockefeller drug laws, you know, back more than 10 years ago through the fight around uh, medical cannabis access in New York state, and then now working on legalization. Um, and so really, you know, going beyond just the, the conversation around how do we end the, the disparate enforcement and policing led to the American arrest crusade in New York, but really even transitioning that conversation more broadly to look at, number one, how do we address those harms? Because it's not enough to just turn the playbook forward. We actually have to deal with the damage that's been done. How do we establish an equitable and just framework for legalization for the business side of things? And then what are we going to do with the money as far as New York State is concerned? And how do we actually reinvest that back into the areas of the state, into the neighborhoods and communities that have just been devastated by prior policies and criminalization? Um, so I'll pause there and kick it back to you. Looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Andy Novick. Andy is the uh, president of New York Small Pharma Limited. Andy, uh, you want to tell us about yourself and your organization? Sure. Thanks for having us. Thanks for the work you do. And we, uh, Small Pharma, are proud members of the coalition that Melissa leads so well. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes of my time to, to tell you a story that illustrates two really essential points that are never part of the conversation when we're dealing about legalization. So you all remember, oh beautiful, uh, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. Well, those amber waves of grain grew across the United States just as cannabis did back in 1895 when that song was first written. But let's say for the purpose of my story that about 100 years ago, the government decided to make grain illegal. But people really wanted their bread. So they went underground. They started growing it indoors in order to not be detected as easily by the authorities. And now it's a century later and the government's realized they can make a lot of money if they start selling grain. So they're lift lifting the prohibition and they're bringing it back, except those amber waves of grain, they're never coming back because our government is idiotically going to continue the illegal practice of growing indoors, even though they're removing the prohibition. So instead of America the Beautiful, we're gonna see bunker after bunker of windowless factories belching out huge amounts of carbon, greenhouse gases into the air that we breathe, spreading it 
from that sea to shining sea and killing off any possibility for future this planet has. And of course, I'm talking about cannabis, not grain. And the way that cannabis is grown is far more destructive to grow indoors than any other plant like wheat. And that's because to force cannabis to grow unnaturally indoors takes an amazing amount of energy. The energy use is so intensive for indoor cannabis cultivation, it's 200 times more energy intensive than a typical office building. And in terms of industries that are really bad for our environment that pollute with massive amounts of carbon, indoor cannabis cultivation is one of the very worst in the nation. And we're in a global crisis right now, worse than we've ever seen. And what's particularly painful about the suicidal direction that New York's government is taking us in is that the reintroduction of the cannabis plant could have and should have been a wonderful opportunity to redress the climate crisis we're in. And they could have done that by requiring that all cannabis is grown outdoors regeneratively. Regenerative agriculture is an affirmative solution we have to climate change. It's not just reducing the amount of greenhouse gases, but in a nutshell, what regenerative agriculture does is it pulls the excess carbon out of the atmosphere and it sequesters it in the soil where it stays. Uh, it's been estimated that if just 10 to 20% of farmers across the world were to switch to regenerative practices, we could literally halt global warming. And the other thing I just want to say, but I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll be quick, is shame on you, Andrew Cuomo. How dare you tell citizens that they that only corporations can grow this plant? Um, particularly knowing that many citizens can't afford the prices that are being charged in dispensaries. And of course, what I'm talking about is the governor's prohibition against home grow. Only other people can grow. You can't grow it yourself. But the right to grow one's own food and one's own medicine is inherent to being a human being. It's a fundamental right. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, no less, described the cultivation of the land and said it's a fundamental right to labor the earth. Plants are our birthright. This plant, the cannabis plant, is a sacred plant and it's been here longer than we have. Indeed, it's, it's so aligned with our bodies that our bodies produce cannabinoids. Our bodies produce, uh, our bodies contain, excuse me, the cannabinoid receptors as well, millions of them. So we are primed to receive the cannabinoids of the plant and we need it. It's essential to our health when the, our own cannabinoids that we produce in our bodies fall down on the job. In conclusion, I wanna say that the governor's short-sighted short -sighted exclusive focus on tax revenues fuels the rapacious greed of the wealthy white businesses that he's partnering with and facilitating this new takeover from the illegal cartel that used to control the cannabis supply to this new cartel that's being given the reins. And I'm gonna conclude with a verse from America the Beautiful that you've never heard before, but I found it online and it's perfect. Oh, beautiful, for glory tale of liberating strife, when once and twice for man's avail, men lavished precious life. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, till selfish gain no longer stain the banner of the free. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Uh, something I should note, um, when people signed up, we had asked a number of questions. And one of them was, you know, do you think that uh, marijuana should be legalized in New York? And a number of people said yes, but only if there was a homegrown option. And so I think that's a really um, hot topic for, for people. Um, and I want to I talk about that a little bit. And also interesting, we asked um, people what they thought the money should go to. And here's our top five in um, kind of family feud style descending order. Number one, uh, infrastructure. Uh, number two, education. Number three, substance abuse treatment. Number four, health care. And number five, uh, budget relief, a la what Andrew Cuomo has been interested in. Um, and uh, so just then, I want to introduce also um, our final panelist. Uh, hi, Gail. How are you? Gail Hepworth is the CEO of uh, Empire State Growers. Hi, Brian. Thanks for, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chronogram. Um, 
I'm Gail Hepworth, and my sister Amy and I founded Hempire Steak Growers in 2019. We are here in the Hudson Valley as also Hepworth Farms, a family operation. We are uh, certified organic vegetable growers. We grow 550 acres of diversified vegetables. And we got into uh, this business uh, simply because we believe in the power of this plant and we believe it should be restored to its rightful place as the people's plant. So I echo Andy's sentiments. Um, um, and with legalization, if it's done correctly, the plant has the capacity to be an economic disruptor and disrupting the status quo where the wealth is created is, is not funneled to the few. Through the de democratization of this plant, communities will benefit and people will have access to affordable plant-based medicinal for better health and wellness. It's not, we gotta keep it simple folks, but I don't know that we'll win, but we can certainly try. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to legalize cannabis in a way that brings this economic opportunity for, into the communities. So, um, I, I want to just say that Hempire State is a vertically integrated business. We are not in the cannabis marijuana business yet, but we are in the CBD business. And I find the plant being categorized differently between CBD and THC and CB, all the cannabinoids rather odd. It is really just one beautiful feminized flower after all. And we have, we grow on our farm, we process and extract on our farm. We recently opened our retail shop here in Milton and we sell wholesale our ingredients. Um, we're certified to nutraceutical or a dietary supplement grade so we can sell to pharmaceutical companies. And we want to encourage cannabis, CBD in the Hudson Valley in New York as an industry, we support all the cottage industries and the people who are using this plant to uh, build a small business or a large business. And I, I know we have a lot to talk about, so thanks, Brian, for having us. Oh, you bet. Thanks, Gail. Um, so firstly, uh, Meg and Marcus, you guys have been at this in Massachusetts for a little bit, and we were talking um, before we got on about um, the way the tax situation works uh, in Massachusetts. And Meg, you had said that Canna had uh, just what re recently written a check for, um, how much was it? From our HCA fee, which is a 3% gross from uh, the top line of our Lee store. So in Lee, Massachusetts, um, it, was a mil it was about a million dollars. It was a little over a million dollars. So <laughs> that went to um, Lee or did that go to the state? It went right to the town of Lee, and um, that that cash infusion, along with their sales tax capture, as well as their um, input that they get from the state tax, helped them uh, not. They didn't have to raise property taxes this year. And if you can imagine a city being able, or a little town, we're only twenty seven hundred people, um, a little town uh, not having to raise taxes in a COVID year, um, that's that was a real blessing to to our uh, residents, of which I'm one. I live here as well, so. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Marcus uh, Rebel um, has also um, ready to pay taxes. Uh, have you guys have you guys written checks yet? We haven't. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, right before the call, uh, September tenth, uh, twenty twenty of last year, we we received our commenced operations. So the way the licensing works, you know, we we received our provisional license for the retail store um, in November of twenty nineteen. Uh, there was a lot of construction that went on during COVID. Uh, around summer of 2020, we achieved final licensing status. Uh, there's other things you have to do uh, post-final as far as inspections and, and compliance requirements to actually operate. Um, so we've only been operational since September of last year. You know, we got about a quarter in. Uh, we will, you know, obviously pay towards that this year, but we're, we're kind of been, you know, we're, 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 we're slightly more in infancy uh, uh, than Meg. You know, Meg, I think... Uh, has seen has seen a bit more, uh, you know. You guys, I know you guys were operational right before COVID, so I, you, you've seen a, a bit more of the roller coaster. You know, we kind of caught the tail end, uh, and and that's a whole different story. Trying to get operational during COVID, uh, 
but, but you know, like we were talking before, uh, there are other establishments in the town of Great Barrington that have been paying uh, significant amounts. Um, I believe Great Barrington, our town, uh, has uh, some of the highest density of retail establishments in the county. Uh, you know, one thing I would like to say in that regard, you know, I, I think the municipalities in Western Mass are, are just being very smart and very sensible uh, when it comes to the benefits of some of that tax revenue. Uh, for people that aren't really familiar with uh, how licensing works in Massachusetts, one of the initial parts of the process is uh, obtaining a host community agreement from the town. You know, the town basically has a say in who can operate. Um, and that, you know, kind of works through the local municipality, uh, residents of the town get to attend public meetings and have a say, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but what I have found, you know, personally in my experience, uh, you know, every town's not the same. Every municipality is not the same. Every select board member is not the same. And so there, uh, uh, and on a town by town, city by city basis, there's been a plethora of experiences here in Mass, some good and some very bad, you know. Uh, there are some towns that have gotten to the point of bribes and lawsuits. I mean, you guys can look it up. I don't really want to speak to that. I think that's an example of the process gone wrong. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a native Bostonian, born and raised. Uh, and, you know, prior to uh, meeting my partner, Charlotte, uh, I was definitely pursuing uh, licensing in my hometown, uh, which, as you might imagine, might make a lot of sense. But, uh, you know, the town of Boston isn't necessarily hurting for taxes. You know, there, there, there's a lot of political pressure there. It wasn't the easiest of things, you know. There, there's a reason I've relocated to Western Mass to towns that are much more friendly to uh, these types of businesses, you know. And 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 to that end, you know, uh, it, it reached a point specifically uh, in the city of Boston where it was so bad uh, they they took the power away from the municipality to make those HCA decisions and actually had to make a, a separate body to handle that, you know. So these are just some of the nightmares, you know, that people have seen. You know, I know some operators that one specific legislator might hold a grudge and hold things up, you know, uh, definitely some of the pitfalls that I think uh, should be researched, you know, on, on the New York side of things and, 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 you know, some things that people might have to deal with if the legislation isn't crafted uh, in a way where it's beneficial. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of part of my experience, you know, as, yeah. as far as the HCA side. Um, Ryan, if I could just interject please. something. With regards to tax, if, if people are, if we're doing this because of taxation, we are not doing this for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Don't tell Andy Cuomo that. Oh, I'll call him. I'll call him. My, believe me, we've had this, we've gone toe to toe about this. So um, I'm just sharing with you that there are so many other benefits that just seem to get glossed over when we talk about the taxes. I have 140 employees. That in a in a and I have seventy of which live in or in my in a tiny little town of Lee, and we pay good wages and we have a a lot of benefit to all the other businesses around us. Everybody benefited from Canna Provisions opening in Lee, Massachusetts. Um, I also just want to point out that if 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 the taxation conversation is the one that's like really cr cranking this, I would just love to say. For reason we're in we're doing this is because I know I can run a great business for good employee for my employees and then the consumers benefit from super happy employees that are selling cannabis to, to everyone. And I would also just point out that the number one reason I got into this was for diversity, equity, and inclusion and the rights of writings of the wrongs of the drug war. And if you look at our panel. Um, this is not what cannabis looks like i'm just telling you we are, this is a diverse group and. And if we were going to say, let's what, what would this panel look like if it actually reflected, it would be all white men, maybe a tenth of me, and maybe a thousandth of Marcus. So let me let me just be really clear. The kudos to putting together this amazing panel of diverse humans who I believe we're all on the same page and that we're doing this for the right reasons, and that is to make sure that there are no many no more harms caused by growing this plant and it, it just needs to stop right now and we are that's why that's why we do what we do every day awesome um thanks meg uh melissa um new york is a home rule state um do you do you have um a sense of what legislation might look like when it comes down yeah so we're actually in the middle of it right now the legislative session kicked off on january 
um, January 6th, actually, so quite a, an interesting day within uh, our country's history. But before everything went down in Washington, D.C., um, Andrew Cuomo released his proposal for what legalization should look like in New York this year. Um, and that's actually a, a rival process or rival bill with the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act that's been in the legislature since 2013. It's sponsored by Senator Kruger and the Assembly Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, who are amazing champions. And just to echo the point that Meg was making, who are really doing this for the right reasons, are not coming out this as simply a way to fill a budget gap or to plug holes here and there, but are really first and foremost justice oriented and are trying to figure out what the best pathway forward is for New York. Uh, so we strongly support the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Um, the governor uh, two days ago came out with an announcement saying that he was going to make some changes to his proposal in light of uh, harsh criticism coming from us within the Start Smart Coalition and many other advocates too. Um, the fact that he didn't include a license option for delivery didn't include on-site consumption this time around and in many cases not only did he not remove criminal penalties but actually escalated them beyond what they were initially so hypothetically the 30-day amendments are going to address some of those things but it's really tinkering around the edges and when we talk about what comprehensive marijuana reform should look like for new york and uh, and the framework that we want to see moving forward in light of everything that folks are raising uh, within this panel discussion and so many of the concerns that are coming up from communities that have been at the target this entire time for decades and decades. Um, it's really more about marijuana justice and that's encapsulated within um, the MRTA or MRTA as some people call it. There's a, a kind of a divide of like which side are you on of how you abbreviate the bill. But however you say it, uh, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act is it. And so within the, the discussion right now, there will be more negotiations kicking off as soon as the Senate hearings wrap. Um, the last one on economic development next week on the 23rd is supposed to focus on cannabis. And so members from the Cuomo administration will be there to testify to senators and answer questions based on the governor's proposal. Um, but at this point, really, you know, so many different legislators in New York, certainly the bill champions, had said, you know, that given the the way that the landscape has shifted just within the legislature over the course of the last couple of years, where now there are Democratic supermajorities in both the Senate and the Assembly, it's really a different game from when you know we were really close to the finish line in 2019. Um, and the legislature is saying, look, we have a great bill on the table. We know that Senator Kruger and Majority Leader People Stokes have thought through so many different lessons learned from other states, you know, have really taken on board, you know, what we can observe and what we can see in terms of what's working and what hasn't and have put that into the MRTA. Um, so certainly, you know, we're looking for that bill to move and we'll see a lot more over the next four weeks, frankly, before the close of the budget on April 1st. Um, but the rest of the legislative session also runs through the beginning of June. So there's still quite a bit of time, but either way, we're certainly in the in the crunch period. Um, and I'll put in the chat again the link to the Start Smart Coalition if folks want to get involved and make sure that you stay updated on ways that you can raise your voice as well. And, and if I can, uh, just in terms of process, so the governor um, has proposed his budget that, that does um, uh, have to get ratified by April 1st. Um, and the MRTA, um, which we strongly support, um, doesn't have to get passed by then. So you have a super majority in uh, the Senate and the Assembly right now um, of Democrats um, who can supersede basically what that means, what the governor wants. Um, and so in past years, the governor has had a lot more sway than he does this year. Um, so he's proposed his sort of the CRT, which is his side of the argument. And then there's the MRTA and you kind of have those two as the the pillars of where the negotiation is going to go. And then basically, if it doesn't pass in the budget, then it, ha it goes through a normal legislative process for a bill to get passed where there's normal negotiations. In past years, um, if everyone thought it needed to get done in the budget because no one would vote for it and they didn't have the super majorities, whereas this year, uh, there's a stronger likelihood that if it doesn't pass in the budget, there's still a strong chance of it going through. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question. Um, there's been, um, a Andy, you brought up um, the outdoor grow. Gail, you have, I've been to your grow operation. Um, you've got acres and acres over there. You're growing outdoors. Um, why in Massachusetts is it's, it's almost solely grown indoors right now, right? So wh why is that and why isn't more being grown outdoors? 
So this was kind of more prohibitionist mentality of fear of um, this plant falling into the wrong hands. Um, it also, I think, in my opinion, it, it all goes to who's really backing the rules and the regs and what's that all about. And generally there's a strong interest to make sure that it's kept to a small group of people that have a lot of money. And ultimately um, that indoor cultivation has shifted. I will tell you, we have 15,000 square feet outdoors that we're going to be cultivating in this year. Um, we have a small 5,000 square foot kind of head house that's operating as our flower home right now, but it will be our head house um, on the same property. Um, we purchased our uh, most recent product from a small micro farmer, 5,000 square feet, and we are thrilled to carry his sun-grown cannabis. And the, the, the mentality and, and the, um, the appetite for this DCC to accept this has changing. And we are big proponents for outdoor grow as well as um, Hoop House. Uh, we're putting a high tunnel in for part of our grow. Um, I've done a lot of small farm practicums, so we know a lot about that type of, of technology. And, you know, this is about, for us, about farmers getting involved. This is about farmers all over the state of New York, upstate, Hudson Valley, um, you know, everywhere to be able to have the, the opportunity to use the sun and maybe a little security cameras and a little bit of tracking to, with the least expensive way to get into this business. And, and there, are, there are spectacular cultivars that actually will grow very successfully in this climate. And you just have to do your work and, and make sure you're managing your crop properly, but it's completely doable. And we are full proponents of that as well as home grow. Nice. And is home grow legal in Massachusetts? Yep. And they've just expanded caregivers and a whole bunch of things. So both of the both of the states I've operated in always had home grow legislation. Um, and it really um, there's always been threats to it in Colorado. There, there, but but most recently it, it opened up and, and less plant counting and more. Let's let people grow their own medicine if they want to. And I'm just telling you from a state where we have, uh, the state did a study of how many cannabis consumers on the recreational side existed in Western Massachusetts. And the number was 30%, which is a phenomenal number. And what I know about this from the business standpoint is the more, ex the more experience and the more um, exposure you get to cannabis, the more likely you are to, to find a way to, to in incorporate it into your wellness routine. And that does not hurt business at all. Um, believe me, we have plenty of people. I grow at home. I still shop at my store. I mean, I could tell you millions of stories of that. So this notion of home grow is going to steal tax dollars and it's going to take away from the market. There's plenty of cannabis consumers. And I, I'm a firm believer in that we should be able to grow outdoors and at home. Nice. Um, Melissa, is there, um, uh, with the upcoming New York legislation, do you think that home grow will be uh, ultimately included? Um, if we move the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, it will be. That's one of the other principal differences between the bill that Governor Cuomo has put on the table, which actually this year took steps backward. Um, in prior iterations, he had allowed for a pilot program around um, medical marijuana patients at least being able to grow their own at home. And still, on, in, in his version, he had banned um, adult users from being able to grow their own at home. But this time, he didn't even include that for medical marijuana patients, which is wild. You know, in a pandemic, when people are really trying to limit their exposure and be extra cautious, you know, for people who, you know, have affordability and access concerns right now as well, to not include home cultivation uh, is it's such a slap in the face for New Yorkers. And so, you know, in that regard, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act does include home grow, has provisions pretty similar to what we've seen in other states around, you know, just making sure that there's like a little bit of security in a safe place where, where the growing is taking place, but otherwise doesn't have the sorts of strictures and is not a prohibition light type of model, which is really what the governor's proposed here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, you know, speaking about that, I'm amazed how far uh, Governor Cuomo has moved in the number of years. Um, you know, it, it just shows how times have changed. I mean, even going back, of course, we all, most of the time, I remember, you know, the, the egg being dropped into the frying pan ad, this is your brain on drugs. Like we've come a, a, a long way and, and I, I didn't expect to see it in my lifetime to be, to be frank. And uh, I'm just curious, like, why, why, why? Why has this happened? What, what changed? 
Well, I think there's a, a few reasons for the change. I think particularly if you look at what is happening in the states surrounding New York, um, it's a no brainer that uh, there's an economic opportunity for the state, though I agree that shouldn't be the major incentive here um, to get tax money. Um, and so uh, they're missing out on that because a lot of people are going out of state to purchase their product or just in New York, as an example, there's one of the largest in the city, like one of the largest underground markets um, in the world, quite frankly. Um, and that all can be regulated. And from a health and safety perspective, it would be better if it goes through a testing procedure with regulated um, entities that have some oversight to make sure that it is safe for the consumer. Um, and I think that when you look at that, that's important. And then pr prim primarily this year, I think you're looking at a humongous budget deficit, which is what's motivating the governor more than usual. But if you do take a look at the CRTA, I agree with Melissa, it's a huge step back from where we were last year even. Um, so while he is uh, saying he wants this to move, um, that, that proposal is a very aggressive stance on how he wants to get it done um, that I don't think many people right now support in full, which is why he's putting out amendments. I wanted to, I wanted to add that um... MRTA, M-R-T-A, that is the only way to go. I certainly, I don't think anyone could disagree that the third part of what is on the table now is way off base. But th there's just, I know we're talking about taxes and God, I would like to even talk more about taxes and what are we gonna do with this tax generation? But I wanna also go back to, I think it was Meg. I mean, in our business, we did grow 200 acres of successful flower outdoor, a hundred acres last year. And we hired 25 professional people, two PhDs, systems engineer, an industrial engineer. We have an attorney on staff. I'm a biomedical engineer. There's another PhD biomedical engineer on our staff, industrial designers, software engineers. There's 25 professional people and over a hundred skilled farm workers brought to bear this crop. So it is, and all of the money, when farms do well, communities thrive and that is not of saying when we, all of our money goes back into the communities that we live in. It's our vegetable business, we do it every year. And cannabis can be along those lines and more actually. So I just wanted to, I cannot, I wanted to really make sure that I'm, I'm, we're doing as much as we can in our business to advocate for CERTA. And it's much more than tax revenue that's at stake here. And certainly, um, we should touch back on the conversation around uh, social justice and what we do with that money because that's an important part of the murder. They are not backing away with making sure that the right thing gets done with the money that is taxed. And I think that that's uh, a powerful um, component of that legislation. Absolutely, Gail. And that I just want to dovetail on that because I think that's a big part of the reason also for why we've seen this shift. You know, absolutely, there's been more education, there's been just more exposure for people and seeing the experience of other states that have legal adult use access, but it's also an issue of justice for New York. When we have a situation in which there have been 800,000 arrests for low-level cannabis possession alone during a time when it was supposedly decriminalized, you know, over the last 25 years, these arrests were not supposed to be taking place hypothetically, and yet they were all across the state. They were predominantly being enforced in communities of color and low-income areas in the state, um, and it just became untenable. You know, when we had a situation where you could have filled up the entirety of Yankee Stadium with the number of people who were arrested in New York City in a single year, for low level cannabis possession, that's absurd. And people recognize that and they're ready to move forward into a new framework and into a new era where we're not expending the resources, locking people up and criminalizing people and tearing apart lives, but instead building up communities, building up individual lives, making sure that we are you know, providing an, an avenue for folks who are you know, small, small family farmers who wanna be able to get in the space as you were just talking about. And then having all of those dollars you know, beyond just the tax revenue, that's its own bucket, but just talking about the multiplier effect in local economies as well is massive. And I think it's something that New York certainly needs to take seriously Seriously, at this point, and the MRTA does that. And so, I just, I just want to add to what yeah, everyone's please. saying is, in terms of the you know the governor's short sightedness, focusing on the tax, echoing what Melissa and Gail are saying, the governor 
have said that this is a $3 billion industry. If we were to give that industry to farms, small farms, micro farms, people who want to grow this plant consciously, outdoors, regeneratively, those $3 billion would stay in New York State. Every year, New Yorkers are willing to part with $3 billion, according to the, govern to the governor, to have their cannabis. Every year, $3 billion could be coming into New York, but instead the governor wants to give it, you know, that, that $3 billion is gonna go the way of profits, often to these multi-state operators from out of state, and he's gonna be satisfied with the few hundred million if he's lucky that he gets from this, as opposed to the billions of dollars that we need in this state now that New Yorkers are the ones paying for, and he's just going to let it go. So and what would, um, what would uh, blue skying it, what would the best uh, case scenario coming out of legislation be for you with regard to small farmers? This plant should only be grown outdoors regeneratively. If you want to grow this plant, you grow it regeneratively. You know, there's been bills in the legislature trying to get to cajole farmers to change their way from, from the way they've been farming to regenerative practices. It's hard to get people to change their ways. And one of the things small farmers said when we were down in Albany is, hey, here's a golden opportunity. Nobody's growing cannabis outdoors. How about this? You say you want a license to grow, you have to grow it regeneratively. This is gonna, and this teaches us how to grow all food, right? And this, not only is it better for us, it's a whole other long conversation, but we start redressing the problem of climate change by doing it this way. So best possible case, you want to grow cannabis, you grow it outdoors regeneratively. Nice. Hey, Brian, I think Andy also is touching on a really important point. And, and we've been very fortunate. And that's one, one of the reasons why Massachusetts was, was high on our radar. Hi. Ha, I love it when we have little puns. Um, so it was, it was a really important state for us. And the reason why is because it doesn't have a limited licensing scheme. Um, just by doing limited licensing at all, you immediately up the cost of how of the and the barrier to entry. So we, we're not supportive of that. Let the locals determine if they want it in their community and how they want it in their community. But other than that, the state the state should support small business. The state should support small operators, and that should be a priority. We really believe that small farms and and equity and social social um, social economic empowerment and all types of priorities should be placed in making sure this program rolls out fairly the first time because you can't get it back in the can. We're struggling with that right now in Massachusetts. We talk about equity all the time, but the challenge is these thousands of pages of regulations is what causes it not to be attainable. It's not, oh, how do we find more money so that you can spend a ton of money unnecessarily on a to highly regulated market. It's just that's antithesis to what we're trying to do. So I would just highly recommend that whatever the focus is, it needs to make sure that small business is a high priority of this. And there's so many case studies that show it. Look at the alcohol industry. Look at craft brewers. It, look at small About, distillers. Uh, They're working are, wonderfully. Could I come this week, tomorrow, or over the weekend and pick up a copy of your uh, Heartland statement? Um, I I wanted to I wanted to say that everybody pay attention because okay, okay, pay right, attention right, to right, what's right. going down around in New York right now. There is a ban being proposed on CBD flour, which we are fighting. Empire State Growers is, has a, um, um, is uh, doing a law, um, to, a litigation to stop it. It's called Stop the Ban, and we're actually doing a fundraiser for the legal, um, um, to raise money to just do the legal portion of it. But uh, it's, it can go wrong and it can go wrong quickly. So yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I absolutely agree with what Meg is saying. Um, and I think it's really important that some of the tax revenue is given to incubator funds so that you can have opportunities for loans, no interest or, or low interest loans that go towards small business and diverse business. And as the only women owned business in New York, I can firsthand tell you we've struggled um, we had an opportunity to actually get an economic state development grant from uh, New York State. We were told we qualify, we're the perfect candidate for it, et cetera. And the day we were supposed to get that grant, 
Um, we actually, it was rescinded because they didn't know how to handle cannabis money because it's federally illegal. Um, so knowing firsthand how this operates and how it's impacted our business, I can say it's gonna be really important to give opportunities to small business and really mean that. I think it's also gonna be really important that you give those businesses the tool to succeed because cannabis business is extremely complicated and it's more complicated than opening just a standard retail shop, but you have tax complexities, et cetera, that if people are not equipped to handle that, um, and those loans are not uh, accommodating that kind of situation, you're going to see a lot of business failure too. Um, and I actually also want to reiterate, I think it would be really important and something that we have mentioned in our discussions with the legislature as well is, is some sort of residency requirement or um, promotion of residency, because I think this is an opportunity for New Yorkers to benefit economically and have their own businesses um, and something that I think is really special and unique um, that I'm, I'm worried is not going to happen. You know, uh, if I could just jump in, uh, one point I'd like to make in that regard, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, the, the taxes have been an absolute windfall. You know, if, uh, if a town chooses to opt in, essentially it's a 20% tax here in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a 6.25% sales tax. There's the uh, 3% community host tax, and then there is a, you know, 10.25 or whatever was left over uh, excise tax. It's, it's a lot of money. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I, I read some articles a few months ago, I think Massachusetts pulled in, it, it, it was north of 100 million. Um, there was also a, a really big issue uh, with the Cannabis Control Commission here in Massachusetts, which is the, uh, the, the regulatory body that kind of uh, administers the, uh, the regulations, the licensing, et cetera. Uh, they have a budget. Uh, they've been fighting for a while to institute some type of social equity loan or grant program. Uh, there are also attempts by some legislators here to do the same. Um, pretty much all got shot down. And uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, the, the CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, last year, they, they returned about $3 million or so dollars uh, to the state that, that they didn't need from their budget. And we're very pissed off because they wanted to, you know, I mean, it's not in the overall scheme of things in this market, it's not a lot, but for small operators, that's a lot. I mean, that could bring a plethora of, of these small farmers that Andy's talking about, some of these entrepreneurs that are participating currently in the informal market, you know, uh, like Hillary had mentioned, uh, this, this could be a leg up there, you know, and uh, I, I definitely think that's one thing for uh, New York to think about, you know, uh, learn, learn from those mistakes. And, 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 and you're right, Melissa, you know, the MARTA, I think, uh, has very smartly addressed a lot of those. And I, and I don't know why uh, certain people can't see that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's important to address them beforehand, because like Meg said, it, it, it's hard to go back. And you will reach a point where there's an I told you so moment. And you don't want that to be the New York market. You don't want that to be the crown jewel market of the East Coast and cannabis. You know, if, if New York gets this wrong, <laughs> you can kiss like a, a, a well-regulated federal market goodbye, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of some of my opinion there. I, I don't know why the fight is so specific uh, in, in the New York legislature right now about these taxes that that's, you can fight the specifics another day when there's loads of cash to, 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 to hand out you know, and, and really just look at neighboring markets and learn from some of these examples. You know, it will, it will kill the market eventually if you don't think about it. You know, it'll make it, uh, it'll make an unsustainable situation. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of add some thoughts there. Well, well said. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, there's no, there's no coming back. I mean, if you don't get things out the door correctly, especially as pertains to small businesses and social equity applicants, there's no way to recoup that first to market advantage. And so, you know, the MRTA, the, the MRDA is really clear about having a strong uh, incubator program. So, you know, making sure that there's not only the low and zero interest loans out the door in the first instance, but also having technical assistance and legal counsel, full like really comprehensive wraparound services to make sure that folks have the support and have the, the structure that they actually need to make sure that we're positioning people for success and not setting folks up for failure. When we look at the scope of the damage that's been done in New York, you know, much to your point, Mark, it's like we, we can't get it wrong, but you know, it's a slap in the face to people on whose backs, you know, we've arrived at this moment to not do things the right way. And just adding that they're not going to do much. I mean, 
I am agree in agreement that murder is much better than the governor's bill, but the legislature also hasn't moved on these issues. The idea that the legislature set a goal by 2050 of reducing carbon emissions by 80%, it's not gonna happen. I went to Albany and I said, whose job is it to pay attention when you issue one law that says you're gonna do this, and now you're gonna invite in an industry that is going to totally nullify your ability to meet your goals. And, and I've asked that question to many legislators and they all shrugged their shoulders and said, I don't know, you, but none of them have moved on the bill. It would be so easy to just say, you wanna grow it? Grow it outdoors, but they're not saying that, not in the legislature, not in the governors. And partially that's because they're not hearing that from people because people don't know this is happening. Well, well said, Andy. Um, so we are uh, running low on time, but um, uh, maybe final thoughts um, from uh, Gail, final thoughts as we uh, exit? There's so much to say, and I, anybody who has like to engage more will be happy in, in my organization to help engage anyone. So much to say. I'm, I'm, I'm floored. We've got a lot of work to do. Yes, uh, and uh, I will say that um, your shop down there uh, in Marlboro on 9W is lovely. If you're down that way, um, check out uh, their, their lovely retail location down there. Yeah, it's awesome. I tell you, it is an awesome experience to deal with the public face-to-face. -face. Anybody who has a brick and mortar and has the opportunity to understand the interactions that this plant is, and our staff is very knowledgeable, and there's so much conversation and so much health benefits that we're not even allowed legally to even say how good it is for all the things that it is. And it'll soon be burst out. It is just a plant after all. Let's keep it, let's keep it simple. Thanks. Nice. Um, well, speaking of retail, Meg, final thoughts? Hey, I would encourage anyone who is, is really looking at this closely. Um, Marcus and I are open right now selling legal cannabis in Massachusetts, and we're not far from a lot of places in New York. So we invite you to please come and visit us. Um, if you want to contact me directly or, or through the store, I would love to help anyone understand exactly how it works and the challenges, um, as well as the passion and and really commitment it requires to make sure that small business that um, economic empowerment that social equity is first it has to be first or it will never ever happen well said um and last word for our sponsor etain hillary Thank you. I think something that we didn't get to touch on is the viability of the medical program as we enter legalization, and that's something I'm very concerned about. So um, the medical program in other states, essentially, um, it's the same products, but at a tax breaks for people who are suffering from chronic illnesses. Um, so you don't have to pay sometimes upwards of 30% taxes. Um, and, and right now, uh, there's still a very restrictive footprint limited for the medical program. And I would like to see any dispensary that enters the, the recreational space be able to sell medical products to provide access in a more for, affordable setting for patients uh, to make sure that medical uh, maintains uh, viability here because I think it's really important and, and this is how uh, most states got started and just seeing firsthand from our patients the benefit that this provides I think it's really important to have that opportunity and I don't uh, see that addressed in either bill um, and I do really hope that if anyone has been inspired here um, to get motivated that they reach out to anyone on this panel it's really an amazing group really grateful to have been able to meet and speak with everybody here because um, there is a ton of work to be done before uh, April 1st. Right, well said. Um, so Chronogram is committed to ongoing coverage of cannabis and what is unfolding. And, uh, you know, we certainly, the chat has been peppered with questions and questions and questions. And it's clear that there's a lot more to talk about this. So I would love to reconvene after uh, the legislation passes um, hopefully, and, and, and we can like look at it together and unpack it and explain it to people who I'm sure are going to have as many or more questions than they had um, today. So um, first, thanks to the panel. You guys are awesome. Really, um, this was a really interesting conversation. Next week, we're going to post this video with all of the resources that people have put into the chat. So chronogram.com, that's probably like chronogram.com slash legal weed, I'm thinking, um, and we'll have the video and all the resources there. And we'll also send out 
an email to everyone who registered for this conversation with those resources. So thanks everybody and uh, look for that. And um, yeah, here's to hoping we get our legal weed in the right way in New York. Great job.